Okay, so good morning. I'm Dr. James Rayfeld from Columbia University, and we'll be talking about new antiarrhythmic drugs for atrial fibrillation trial data and considerations with respect to algorithm placement. Uh, these are my disclosures. I show these in all uh, programs that I do, and I work with almost every company that's brought out an antiarrhythmic drug or device, but I don't invest in them, and my, pro my presentation is designed to be free of bias. There's been a resurgence of interest in antiarrhythmic drug development during the current decade, with a particular focus on the treatment of atrial fibrillation. One new agent has reached the marketplace, that is dronetarone, a non-toxic derivative of amiodarone. One agent currently available for the treatment of angina has preliminary data suggesting efficacy for atrial fibrillation, that's renolazine, and many other agents are under development, most of which have been termed atrial selective or atrial specific, and one of which is in phase three trials, and that's vernacolant. So let's look at these three as representatives of where the field is going. Trinetarone uh, did many trials in its phase two and three clinical development program. They are summarized on this particular slide. There was the Daphne study, which was a dose-ranging efficacy and safety trial in AF cardioversion and the maintenance of sinus rhythm. It tested 400, 600, and 800 milligrams twice a day. The results of this trial suggested that only 400 milligrams BID would go into further clinical development as the higher doses were not well tolerated due to GI toxicity. Eurydice and Adonis, two identical trials conducted in different regions of the world whose results were pooled, were granetarone versus placebo trials looking at the endpoint of time to recurrence of atrial fibrillation. So this was maintenance of sinus rhythm in patients with non-permanent atrial fibrillation. Erato was a trial in permanent AFib looking at how much rate control, that is reduction in ventricular rate, would occur with trinetarone. Dionysus was a short trial comparing head-to-head -head amiodarone and trinetarone, looking at the reduction of recurrent AF or premature study drug discontinuation for intolerance or lack of efficacy. Athena was a trial in AF patients who had high risk markers for events, and the primary endpoint was reduction of the combination of cardiovascular hospitalization or death from any cause in this high-risk AFib population. And Andromeda was a trial specifically for safety in very high-risk patients, those being class 4 heart failure or lesser heart failure with recent decompensation. This was not specifically an AFib trial. The results of these trials are on this next slide. As you can see, the Daphne trial revealed that only 400 milligrams BID should be tested in future trials. The Eurydice and Adonis experience revealed renetarone to be superior to placebo in prolonging the time to the first recurrence of atrial fib or atrial flutter. Both Eurydice and Adonis and Erato revealed that renetarone does reduce the ventricular rate both at rest and with exercise, usually about 10 to 15 beats per minute. Dionysus showed that amiodarone was superior to dronetarone in terms of efficacy, but that it was less well tolerated and stopped more often for intolerance and toxicity. Athena revealed that dronetarone reduced cardiovascular hospitalization, including the components of hospitalization due to atrial fibrillation as well as acute coronary syndrome, with a trend towards reduced total mortality in the high-risk AFib patients. And Andromeda the thorn in the side of this development program, if you will, revealed that dronetarone increased hospitalization for heart failure and mortality in a severe heart failure population, and it was stopped prematurely. Consequently, in this country, dronetarone, the brand name Multac, received approval to reduce the risk of cardiovascular hospitalization in patients with paroxysmal or persistent atrial fib or flutter with a recent episode meeting non-persistent FIB and one or more of the associated cardiovascular risk factors that were inclusion criteria in the Athena trial. It did not receive an indication to reduce mortality because that was only a trend in Athena. The contraindication in this country, as well as around the world, is class 4 heart failure or lesser heart failure with recent decompensation, and that's based on the Andromeda study note this indication is not simply for the reduction of atrial fibrillation. Um, 
that approval was attained in Europe where the drug is approved for the reduction of atrial fib and to slow the ventricular rate response. But the indication in this country is more specific. So here is the wording of the uh, European uh, indication. Where should we use dronetarone based upon this particular indication? Well, if we think about the 2006 ACCAHA ESC guidelines, and we remember their drug disposition is divided by no heart disease, hypertension, coronary disease, heart failure, and we combine dronetarone's experience as well as its indication, you can see that in no or minimal heart disease, dronetarone would appear to be a reasonable first-line choice in those patients who meet its inclusion criteria from Athena and its indication criteria who do not have heart disease, meaning age over 70, diabetes, prior stroke, or large left atrium. In the hypertensive population, then the additional risk factors in the package insert, that is the approval package, would suggest that either hypertension or a reduced ejection fraction would be reasonable criteria to suggest this drug should be used first line. And that holds true in coronary disease and heart failure as well. Remembering that in the heart failure population, it's contraindicated with class four heart failure or recent decompensation. The second drug I want to mention is renolazine. It's a unique agent with effects on multiple ion channels, many of which are the same channels affected by amiodarone. It's approved for the treatment of angina, and importantly, it has not been associated with any organ toxicity or with proarrhythmia. It has as its most frequent side effects constipation and some vague dizziness, but no serious organ toxicity. It is electrophysiologically active. Renolazine is an inactivated state sodium channel blocker, that is the late sodium channel. It has little effect on peak sodium in ventricular myocardium, but has a functionally significant effect in atrial myocardium. Renolazine also blocks IKR, but it prolongs the QT interval only modestly with a mean of six milliseconds because the QT prolonging effect, that is the actual potential duration prolonging effect from potassium blockade is offset by the inhibition of the late sodium uh, current, inward uh, current. Renolazine prolongs atrial refractoriness and decreases its dispersion. It prolongs atrial conduction velocity. It prevents early after depolarizations in ventricular and atrial tissue and has reduced firing in pulmonary vein sleeves, all of which may contribute to an antifibrillatory effect in the atrium. Renolazine has reduced exercise-induced ventricular arrhythmias in patients with coronary disease, probably best characterized in its Merlin trial in acute coronary syndrome, where renolazine reduced ventricular ectopy, non-sustained VT, and atrial arrhythmias, including new-onset AFib. And in animal models, renolazine has reduced inducibility of atrial fib and pulmonary vein triggers. That led Dr. David Murdoch and myself uh, to do several small pilot series of AFib patients. And these have demonstrated that renolazine can be effective in some patients with new onset paroxysmal AFib, for atrial fib that has become refractory to previously effective agents, as a pill in the pocket for AFib termination in those who've become refractory to previously effective class 1C agents or to sodalol, and to facilitate direct current cardioversion after failure off a drug. Some of that data is on this slide. This is our pill in the pocket experience. 31 patients with either new or recurrent paroxysmal fib of short duration, that is three to 48 hours. Mostly men, mean age 70, 80% 80 with structural heart disease. So this is a population in which we couldn't use pill in the pocket class 1C drug. We're given renolazine, 2,000 milligrams, either as a single dose or as two 1,000 milligram doses in close succession. 22 were in the hospital, five in office, four at home, and 24 of 31 converted to sinus rhythm within six hours, a conversion rate that approximates that seen with class 1C drugs. And remember that placebo uh, conversion rates in all of the class 1C trials were half or less than half of the conversion rates of the active drug. Importantly, even in this population with heart disease, there were no proarrhythmic events or no adverse hemodynamic events. And we suggest that this um, type of experience be carried out in larger trials. In patients with prior antiarrhythmic therapy, we studied 13 patients who had very frequent PAF that was successfully controlled for at least two years with either a class one drug, flecainide or propafenone, 
or in a few with the class three drug, uh, essentially Sotalol. Then their episodes recurred with approximately the same pattern that existed prior to any therapy over a fairly short period of time, meaning months. They were changed to renolazine. Renolazine was successful in 10 of the 13. Two discontinued it for side effects, none serious. In one, it did not work. And of the 10 successfully controlled, eight have remained on the drug with good tolerance. Three had no AFib at all, with a mean follow-up of eight months. Two had some, but greater than 75% reduction with tolerable side effects. And in two, the drug was discontinued because of dizziness and constipation. So here again, we have data that suggests that renolazine can be effective in at least some AFib patients and is deserving of larger trials. One additional experience of note was a 58-year-old woman who gave a history of symptomatic persistent AFib for about three years. She was managed medically with AV nodal agents, but AFib recurred after each three separate cardioversion attempts. Because she felt better with improved exercise tolerance after each cardioversion, a rhythm control strategy was adopted. A history of a positive stress test precluded either class 1A or, for that matter, 1C antirhythmics. Sotalol was initiated and titrated to 160 milligrams BID, but she developed an episode of persistent torsade requiring defibrillation. And she was then transferred to our institution, Columbia University Medical Center, for ablation, which was performed with that incident. However, AFib recurred following pulmonary vein isolation, including after a two-month blanking period and a further left atrial ablation was scheduled. While awaiting that ablation, she was put on renolazine, one gram BID, and cardioverted once again. After three months, including a three-week continuous outpatient monitoring period, she remained in sinus rhythm and deferred re repeat ablation. This was a slide set I put together two months ago, and now at five months, she continues to remain in sinus rhythm. So again, a different line of of patients, if you will, this one being persistent AFib suggests that renolazine can be effective. Where might it fit in our algorithm? Well, since it can be given across the spectrum of heart disease, it can fit in the boxes with no heart disease, hypertension, coronary disease for which it has an angel indication, uh, or LV dysfunction. So I think it's a very promising agent to look at further. And finally, there are a large list of other agents under development, many of which, as I suggested earlier, were atrial-specific agents, only some of which are listed on this slide. Atrial-specific agents are an interesting set of compounds because they take advantage of, of the fact that in the atria, there are some channels that are not active in the ventricle, the ultra-rapid potassium channel and the IKACH channel. In the remodeled atria, during fibrillation, when action potential duration shortens, these early activating channels become dominant in the repolarizing mechanism. And on the right of this slide, you can see the IKS and IKR channels uh, are much, much less important. So the drugs that target these channels, which are active in the fibrillating atrium and are not present in the ventricle, at least in theory, should be able to reduce AFib, terminate it if it's present, perhaps prevent it without the risk of ventricular proarrhythmia. And the furthest along is vernacolant originally called RSD1235 with a proposed trade name of Kinepid, although it is not yet approved. It's in, it is in class three, it is in phase three trials. It is a frequency and voltage dependent sodium channel blocker. It also blocks early activating potassium channels, particularly the IKACH channel. It has rate enhanced activity on conduction, so it's more potently effective during fibrillation. It has atrial selective effects on APD and ERP prolongation. The activity has been confirmed in several species. It has very rare adverse hemodynamic effects intravenously, and is being developed both IV for conversion and oral for the prevention of AFib. Its IV studies to date have included several important trials. Two of them, ACT-1 and ACT-3, were virtually identical. Double-blind placebo-controlled phase three trials, ACT-1 being um, somewhat larger than ACT-3, ACT-2 was a post-op AFib study, again, randomized placebo-controlled, double-blind, and the results were similar in each of these. It was conversion of recent onset AFib that is less than seven days in 52% of the drug-treated patients, but only 4% of placebo-treated patients with a median time of 8 to 11 minutes. If the patients had longer-lasting AFib, that is three to 45 days, 
the conversion rates were 38 to 41 percent um, versus 3 to 4 percent with placebo. Interestingly, the drug does not work for atrial flutter, perhaps because its effects are more marked in the left atrium than the right. Potentially serious adverse events were 1.4 to 2 percent in these trials versus 0 to 1 percent uh, in the placebo treated patients with no torsade. So you can see it appears to be a pretty safe drug. And on the right of the slide, you can see from the largest of the trials, the ACT1 study, in white placebo and in magenta vernacolant, you can see the short and long duration AF conversion rates compared to placebo, and in the far right, the overall population. The most common adverse events have been dyskusia, sneezing, and paresthesias. There have been very rare significant adverse hemodynamic effects, bradycardia and hypotension, both less than 1%, perhaps vaguely mediated. The trials did exclude severe heart failure and acute MI, and I suspect that any package insert that's developed will likely exclude symptomatic ischemia or a history of heart failure or hypotension. There were two ventricular fibrillations, one a death in a severe aortic stenosis patient who was a protocol violator and should not have received this drug, suggesting a, a risk rate of about 1.4 per thousand patients in individuals with prior risk factors. And there's one torsade in the database in which the drug was given subsequent to ibutilide, which was also a protocol violation. And ibutilide, as you know, has a significant incidence of torsade. The FDA requested an additional trial to be performed. It's anticipated that this will be completed sometime in 2011 or early 2012 and oral studies are also underway. Now, not all of the investigational agents have been successful. Cabasarod, a HT4 receptor antagonist, azimilide, tadisamil have gone by the wayside. But as you can see from the, this list, there are many, many more, both atrial selective derivatives of amiodarone, gap junction modifiers. Um, so stay tuned. This is a growing list in an exciting field. Thank you for your attention.